Hi folks, uh, welcome to the Tech Change Studio. We are thrilled today to have Wayne Voda, a digital development entrepreneur and the founder of ICT for Jobs, ICTforDjobs.com. Uh, I'm your host, Nick Martin, CEO, founder of Tech Change. And today, Wayne, we are gonna be talking about all things jobs related for ICT for D. Great, as someone who just got a new job, I'm happy to talk about jobs. All right, so when the first question I would love to ask you is, say I am a newly minted graduate, fresh out of undergrad, uh, how do I begin to think about breaking into the information communication technologies for development landscape? So it's a challenge oftentimes because there's a lot of competition. People want to work and using the tools of technology to improve the lives of people around the world. And I think that one of the best ways to get into ICT for D is to actually have experience in ICT for D. But of course, that is always the problem. They want you to have experience, but you don't have experience. But to get experience, how do you do it? <laughs> and I'm actually a big fan of volunteering. Um, and that isn't the concept of just volunteering for a weekend or a week or two weeks, but actually being very specific, thinking of volunteering as a consultative agreement where you are doing it for free in exchange for experience and connections. So that you actually write a project plan, you write a brief, you build out as if you're going to do a consultative activity and yet you just put zero as what they're paying you or maybe a minimal stipend. Mm -hmm. And in that way that you are willing to show that you're going to put sweat equity into this experience, you're going to bring some kind of defined value to the organization. And the organization is, is able to get a defined value from you. And at the same time, they can understand your work skills to see if you're willing, worthy of being paid. Or better yet, you know, if not that organization, an organization that works with them. Yeah. Any tips for how to do that well? I'm just thinking uh, maybe setting time frames so that you're not just working and volunteering uh, mm -hmm. indefinitely. Uh, strategies that uh, particularly those who are, are newer and younger to the field might be able to employ so that they don't in the long run maybe get taken advantage of? Right. I think the, f the first aspect should be researching the organization, mm -hmm. making sure they understand the values, they understand the mission of the organization, understand its true needs. And then and in that process, connect with key stakeholders of the organization so they understand what is the specific problems the organization faces and would enjoy support in achieving. And then yes, very much making a very uh, defined engagement. I'm going to help you with this research report uh, in this country on this mm -hmm. question, try to answer this question in this specific time frame. And then have that as a engagement, as a literally as a contract and just have zero as the value of the contract. And with the explicit understanding that the organization is going to introduce or help you uh, understand better the ecosystem that in which they work. Uh, and I want to pick up on a thread we were talking about before we started the shoot about how somebody might go about uh, doing some of that research and legwork in the form of networking. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're someone who's obviously done a lot of networking. It's something that we take very seriously here at Tech Change. Uh, what are some tips for getting out there and trying to, to get, get known uh, and meet people in this, in this field? It's interesting, so many people say, but I don't know anybody. How do I <laughs> yeah. break into a field where I don't know people? And I like to remind us all, you know, all of us really, we all know a lot of people. Yeah. We don't necessarily think through who they know and who their friends know. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you ever look on the fun thing on LinkedIn, you are, um, Facebook, you see like you're connected to how many thousands of people just being sure. connected to a few people. So I always think, Look at what you want to do, break it down to some of the key skills or geographic areas, and then go with your existing network and see who knows someone who is working in that field or in that geographic area and build from there. Yeah. I mean, all networks start with sure. one yourself and then one, two, your friend, but then you can build from that. And it's interesting, I mean, what is it, seven degrees of Kevin Bacon, right? We're all, we all know Kevin Bacon within seven degrees. So theoretically, six or seven. is it, it six? six? Degrees. Even better, <laughs> six degrees of Kevin Bacon. One degree closer. I'm with like three within Kevin Bacon. So, you know, that's the interesting aspect sure. is you should be able to network into any organization. I would almost take, uh, to add to that, kind of take it one step further and say, be tactical about it, right? Maybe uh, you can get out an Excel spreadsheet and actually think about your network uh, and, and um, you know, start to make notes and figure out who you think top 10, top 20 people you can start to talk to 
who know people that you want to know and then look for events, right? There's lots mm -hmm. here in Washington, D.C., obviously, but uh, you and I have both hosted ICT for Drinks Happy Hours in mm -hmm. a number of countries, uh, and not there's just also, in the U.S., but other, other parts of the world. Yeah, online activities as well. There are also webinars, there's meetups, there's ICT works to understand and to write for uh, what's going on in ICT for D. And so in this concept, uh, I've actually seen people not just have the spreadsheet idea, but create a relationship database mm. where they have the contact, they have who that contact knows, the topics they talked about with that contact, yeah. the last time yeah. they talked to them yeah. so they can come back and talk and remind them again of the meeting they had. So really taking this concept of networking and specifically informational interviewing to its um, practical application to get a job. And, Sorry, this concept about informational interviewing, I think this is key. Yeah, say more about that. Too many people go in and they think networking is some kind of a thing, like I have to go network, and then they stand to the person and say, hi, what do you do? Which is that wonderfully awkward question and kind of doesn't lead anywhere. If you look up, there's, the, there's an actual concept of informational interviewing, which is trying to ask a person, so what do you do in your day? How did you get to this job? Where do you see, the, where do you see this job leading? What is your career? future career trajectory, what do you hope for? What do you think is a threats or opportunities to your um, the, to the field or to your role mm -hmm. within the field? And really you're quizzing them, you're trying to understand from them what they're going through, how they got there and where they're going. It's not about you, it's not about giving them your CV and saying, oh look at my CV, let's talk about this. It's actually interviewing the other person, understanding what's going on in their life and then using the information to interpret better for yourself how is this a role that I want to have and how can I go about getting it based on their experience? Yeah, I love that and I know both of us obviously have done many informational interviews um, when we're starting out in our careers but also for other people when they can't have come to us. Thinking about that context, I have a few ideas on this too but I'm curious to hear what you think. Uh, what, what makes for a good request for that, uh, for that informational interview? Mm. What, how much research should people have done before they come to you and what should that ask be? How targeted should that ask be? In my experience I feel that if you really want to get somebody's attention, if you really want to have an informational interview with somebody, you should be asking them as a favor from a friend. So for mm -hmm. example, um, Nick, uh, I would love, um, I was speaking with Wayne Voda recently who said that you really understood the concept of online learning. I'm excited about online learning. I'd like to try to understand better what a career could be in online learning. And I'd love to understand how you came into this profession, what you're doing with Tech Change, how it became an, such an innovative organization. And um, I'd really appreciate having a short call with you sometime soon. Wayan said that you are always open to helping people and I would appreciate the support. I like that, I think that's great. Um, I'm just thinking too, uh, but something I appreciate is if someone's respectful of my time mm -hmm. and sometimes uh, I feel like I always have 10 to 15 minutes for mm -hmm. anybody even if it's right. more of a cold call or a friend of a friend and so being able to get on the phone for that 10-15 minutes not an hour not two hours not even coffee with the wrong person can sometimes be a too big of a commitment but and really targeting lunch. that ask and um, and then building up gradually and then right. the stronger the connection I think the more leverage somebody has to then ask for more time but mm -hmm. but I think starting out that's a good metric so yes a uh, half hour phone call I yeah. think is a very nice defined amount of time mm -hmm. that doesn't feel like it's a giant mm -hmm. obligation and then having done your research beforehand knowing about the person in the organization having some context I think will lead for a richer conversation it does still alarm me how many folks have asked for my time and haven't done some fairly basic legwork around the organization or um, the path that we've taken here. So uh, as much as you can do or, or have the time to do, I would recommend it as well. Yeah. All right, so Wayne, we're gonna move next to the ever popular question, should somebody go to grad school in international development? Dun, dun, dun. Uh, wow, the grad school question. I get asked this a lot and I have a, maybe a contrary opinion to many. I think in the grand scheme of international development career, you need to have a master's degree. Mm -hmm. Almost in anything that you want. Uh, I don't necessarily think the exact topic is oftentimes that relevant or a barrier or, a, or a, a boost, but the degree does help. It's not something I feel that one should get right out of undergrad. Mm -hmm. I think that one should get out of undergrad, get a few jobs, 
have some experience, understand what they really want to go to grad school for, and how that degree would help them in their future quest, which I think is a huge aspect, again, going back to information interviewing, finding people that you really respect, you think are amazing, how did they get there, which degree did they take, when did they do that degree? I think that, to me, the concept of an international development degree, degree or any master's degree or greater, is a huge investment of time, of resources, of opportunity cost, and that you could achieve similar activity or a similar level of advancement by volunteering or by having a field-based experience um, rather than going to grad school. And I want to pick up on that thread too because the cost is tremendous. It is real and it's continuing mm -hmm. to increase for folks. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to me to think about a Kennedy School degree, $100,000, $150,000. But even in, in, as we look at, uh, across the schools in Washington, D.C., Georgetown, GW, SICE, American, all climbing up there in cost. So, uh, so I guess maybe one advice would be to really weigh that, that uh, cost, is it worth it? Uh, because as we know, on the other end, there, these jobs, especially in more entry-level positions, don't pay that well. Right, so you're looking at, what, 75,000, maybe $100,000 in just tuition alone? Yeah. If you're doing a full-time program, that means you're having the opportunity cost of not earning income for that time period. If it's a two-year degree, that's, what, 150,000, so 75,000 per year. So maybe you're giving up there, you've invested now 250, maybe $300,000 in a degree, and are you really gonna see that return on investment in an international development career where we know the salaries are not the same as the private sector? So I'm a big fan, and I, I lived it, of um, doing grad school while working full time. Uh, it definitely was a trying period in my life. Uh, my wife and I struggled through that time period, uh, but it was, uh, for me, um, I was able to go to grad school, I was able to maintain a full-time job, pay for grad school in cash, and graduate debt-free. Yeah, and I took a different route, I mean, uh, but also what came out debt-free, found a, a very cheap, affordable university in Costa Rica yes. called the University for Peace, which is a great school um, for a fraction of the cost of, of a, uh, an expensive degree here, and did a one-year, 10-month uh, master's program, and, uh, and was very happy with the experience, got to travel, learn Spanish, uh, and have some of that field experience that you mentioned too. So there are other models for this. I think that's something that I think people maybe not always realize when they're doing their initial search. One of the interesting aspects, I was able to do my graduate degree at the same university where my wife worked, and so I got um, spousal tuition uh, uh, discount, which mm. was very helpful in that tuition. Uh, yeah, so there's lots of ways to do this, folks. Uh, and apologies for the sirens in the background here. Uh, They're so, coming for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Wayne, I want to ask you a question now, uh, building from the, the sort of uh, grad school debate. What IT skills would you say matter the most to today's ICT for D professional? That's a good question. I'm often asked that one. What IT skills should I be focused on? Should I learn? And actually, I feel that it doesn't really matter. If you are excited about Fortran or jQuery, take your pick, go for it. it the real challenge and what I find that uh, employers are really looking for is the ability to bring together different aspects of technology and blend it together to a project. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to do a project where you're engaging citizens to better understand what's happening with the government, you should be able to think through how do we get information from citizens. Maybe it is mobile phones uh, through text messaging, maybe it's social media. Maybe it's looking at how people are interacting in other ways with government and bringing it forth. And then how are you going to visualize that data so decision makers actually understand what's happening with it. And then how are you going to then bring the data back down to the people that you collected it from so they feel a part of the entire process. Mm -hmm. That matters more than knowing the latest yeah. uh, Hadoop cluster yeah. setup. So what I'm hearing is definitely being able to be adaptable, finding tools you're excited about, but also understanding those users that we're trying to work with and serve, and understanding the full aspect of the data cycle. So how do you collect data better? How do you manage data better? How do you visualize it better? That's definitely a skill, regardless of what platform you end up choosing. Um, what about uh, proposal writing and business development? Where does that world fall uh, into play? Wow. Well, I have the belief that if you're not part of the business development process, you're not going to have a job very long. You have to be part of it. It is how we all make the money to make everything move. Um, and 
To me, the role of a technologist, someone who understands how we use technology development, is to help practitioners think through how they can use technology to better the overall development goals and don't get blinded by the shiny flashy of the latest technology. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I remember someone recently said, oh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, all, all these ways we can use Bitcoin. And to me, that was coming at it in the wrong way. It should be, how can we look at financial inclusion? Where are there opportunities to improve the way cash flow happens between countries? One of those solutions could be Bitcoin but there are many others. And so really coming at it from the problem aspect mm -hmm. versus the technology aspect. That's great, I just bought some Bitcoin, so now I feel bad. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Bitcoin just crashed apparently. <laughs> so, okay, Wayne, so we've talked a bit about the IT skills that matter most, uh, but also abstracting that a bit and trying to really understand problems. Um, to that point, or maybe taking it a step further, trends that you're seeing across the landscape, has anything come to mind that, that we should be mindful of at the more macro level? So I think one of the trends that we should be thinking about at the macro letter level is this concept of data. Uh, we are finally now in the international development field being able to generate massive amounts of data from our programs. And that could be anything from um, the number of constituents that come to a health center and the interactions they have at that health center to um, how people are conversing back and forth on social media about um, citizen engagement issues and issues with their government to ways in which we are able to look remote remotely sense what's happening in an agricultural field and then convey that information down to a farmer. So I think we're producing, we are, gigabytes, tetrabytes of data and the challenge now is how do we manage, how do we analyze and to an extent how do we protect the data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, right? We're seeing a lot more focus on responsible data plans within organizations, trying to think uh, holistically about the, the entire uh, cycle of data as it comes in. And then what to do when you have too much data, right? This is a big problem. How do you build capacities internally uh, and on teams for being able to manage that data and to do really robust monitoring and evaluation with that data? A good place to plug the Merle Tech Conference, which happens uh, every year in Washington, D.C., and also London, and I think is expanding to other parts of the world as, as one vehicle to learn more about that that world. And to me, this concept of data is very interesting. I'm starting to see more and more organizations specifically want someone who understands data science, or mm -hmm. at least someone who can visualize data or present data in a way that decision makers can take action on it. And to an extent, it doesn't have to be really fancy, like you don't have to know R or Stata or something like this. It can be essentially a Google Sheet that you're able to bring in real-time information from a mobile data collection tool, take it into that Google Sheet, visualize it in a way that a decision maker can understand, and then hopefully also bring that data back down to the person who collected it so they're rewarded for their input. If only there were an online course that taught you how to do all those things. True, actually, I think there, there could is. be one. Tech Change offers a four-week online uh, certificate course in technology for data visualization, which covers a lot of these topics. And again, it's one of those things where, yes, you will develop skills in specific technology platforms, but really what it's geared for is thinking intentionally about process, about how to develop internal capacities and systems to be able to uh, implement any technology, but uh, but do so with with the right uh, thinking in place. So uh, definitely something that I think folks would be interested in if, if you want to build that skill set. And I think you might overlook one other aspect. When you yeah. do a course online or offline, yeah. the interesting aspect is you're in a room of people who have self-selected that they are interested in this topic and they want to learn about this topic and apply it. So if you are someone who is looking to apply this as well and you're thinking, I don't know anybody, uh, who would I know that works on this? You are now have 20, 30, 50, 100 other people who are just as interested in you in this topic and people that you can connect with and then network with and understand and informational interview and grow your own network. Yeah, it is a great way to, to build that initial base of, of people who share that interest. And we've had a lot of students come in and take these courses, uh, talk with some of the speakers and experts who've done presentations, and then go on to get jobs at these places because uh, they met through the TechChange course. So yeah. One day, I hope to be <laughs> so honored as to be a part of a tech change course. <laughs> well, that, that we may have to wait a while for that. Uh, okay, Wayne, a couple more questions for you, my good friend. Um, when you look out across the ICD4D landscape, what are some of the companies and organizations that you get most excited about that are really pioneering new approaches to how to solve some of the world's most pressing problems with the help of technology? I think there are, there are several levels of organizations that are working on these issues. At the large level, at the, the macro level, you have USAID, 
um, who has a global development lab focused on the technology for development issues. You have UNICEF, which has their innovations team, which is doing some really cutting edge work. They just did the first contract that was totally done through blockchain. Yeah, I saw that. Very exciting. So I think it was really interesting activity. Um, to an extent you have, uh, well actually Diffid does a really good job at thinking through these issues as well. And to an extent you have um, a lot of the foundations, Gates, um, Rockefeller, mm -hmm. Ford, that are thinking this way as well. So a lot of the, the larger organizations are moving this way. Of course, because of that, the implementing partners are also moving that way. You have like FHI 360, DAI, APT, um, Creative, Creative, RTI, um, on the like the macro players that have multiple different fields they look at, and then the, the level another level is the niche players that are looking on specific activities. Mm -hmm. Like um, I always like you know equal access. Looking at radio and mobile phones are Farm Radio International, which does really cutting edge work in the agricultural space. Uh, Intra Health, uh, which is looking at different ways in which to help health workers improve themselves using technology. So I think in this aspect, the second tier is really cool. Mm -hmm. And then at the country level, there are multiple now really innovative organizations, oftentimes small, oftentimes unable to pay an expat salary, but who are really, really pushing the envelope on what's possible. And that I think for, especially for someone in uh, early to mid career who wants to really understand how these issues play out on the ground, would be organizations they should be looking at and begging to do a volunteer internship with to just really get that sense of what's happening and how innovative it, the, our constituents are in using technology in their daily lives and how we can replicate and scale that at national and global levels. So, so getting back to that idea of how do you break in, this could be one way either mm -hmm. through volunteering or, or getting a, an entry level job at one of these smaller organizations that's doing really exciting work with, with technology but uh, maybe has um, less intense hiring process or maybe be more accessible and easier to connect with. So I practice what I preach. Yeah. In 2008, I left the comfort of Mercy Corps and I joined a startup called Invenio that was really looking at how to integrate technology in the education space as when I first started there and then we expanded other places. Uh, I took a $25,000, $30,000 pay cut, or pay and benefits cut. Had to have a long talk with my wife to do it. But it was one of the most formidable experiences of my life. It was the best four and a half years mm. I've ever, well, ever worked somewhere. Uh, present employer hopefully exempted from that, <laughs> <laughs> that specific line. Uh, but it was, it was wonderful and it was amazing. And sure. I would highly recommend if you can find that creative um, startup young organization that has strong leadership to take a risk and make a bet if you have the the financial capacity and the career ability to do it, it will pay benefits for years afterwards. I still look back on my time at Invenio as defining my understanding and skills in international development. No, it's an amazing story. Uh, so, so Wayne, final plug here. We want folks to sign up for ict4djobs.com as a great resource to kind of know what some of the, the specific opportunities are, but are there other things that, that uh, you think people should do uh, as a call to action to get them uh, excited about looking for that new career? So I think ICD4DJobs.com is a great resource. We publish 20 to 25 really amazing job opportunities every other week. And along with, we give tips and advice, often from my own painful experience on how to improve your career. <laughs> uh, honest, honestly, I'm honest with, my, with the people I work with. And then at the same time, I think courses like Tech Change are great to have to get these skills and understanding and to meet new people that are working in this field. And then be active. Be active online, be active in person, go to meetups, uh, participate in online forums, volunteer to help with activities and initiatives. I cannot stress how much that it matters that people volunteer for these activities because that is where, in those volunteer activities, is often where I know I look for new staff because if they're volunteering, it shows they have a desire and a want to work on that topic. So I know if I employ them to do that topic, I know that they're going to be excited about coming to work every day. And so that, that volunteering aspect counts. And then mm. be active online. I was actually just realizing recently how many people I met um, in 2000, between 2007 and 2009 that were tw on Twitter and via mm. Twitter. Mm. Uh, Linda Raftree I met via Twitter, James Bond Tempo. We, did, we started fail festivals on Twitter. I mean, all these interesting cool. things came out of essentially a social media activity. 
So I know social media can sometimes feel fluff, but if you actually practice it as a professional experience, it can pay amazing dividends. No, oh, that's exciting to hear. So hopefully you've watched this, you've gleaned some inspiration from our conversation here. I would say if folks do have a specific question that, they, that we didn't touch on today that they want some kind of insight on, feel free to leave it in the comments below and maybe we can do a follow-up episode in, in, a, in a couple months uh, and see where we are. Yeah, happy to. Um, I'm sh I always try to answer all the comments. <laughs> Good, bad, or ugly. Uh, because everybody's opinion is valid and we should really respond to them. So thank you. All right, folks. Nick and Wayne signing off from Tech Change. Take care and have a wonderful day.